you've made your mind up to love, nobody can stop you. They can say all sorts of hard things about you, they can treat you in a very mean, miserable way, but they cannot stop you loving. Is that right? Nobody can stop you. The perfect example of that is Jesus. They did everything to him. They beat him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They gave him vinegar to drink. They beat him. They abused him. They reviled him. They pierced his hands and his feet. But one thing they could not do was what? They could not stop him loving. He loved them to the end. You see, if you love with that kind of love, nobody can stop you. It's the perfect law of liberty. You are the only really free person on earth. Because nobody can stop you doing what you want to do. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, I'm, I'm impressed when I think about it. Nobody can stop you. That's why it's called the perfect law of liberty. I, I share something which God sometimes impels me to share. It's very difficult to share. It's very painful. But after my... After God called my wife Ruth home to himself, I went through time of deep grief but I learned how much people loved me it was a revelation I got letters from many different parts of the world people from different races different denominational backgrounds comforting me assuring me of their love and their prayers it was a, I never knew there was so much love in the world till that happened. I didn't know that so many people <laughs> loved me, and I'm sure I'm not an easy person to love. But after all, persevere, <laughs> and you can achieve it. <laughs> but I got one letter from a lady, I don't even remember her name. And she directed me to Psalm 84, verse 6. It says in verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. In other words, he has no permanent residence in this world. He's on a pilgrimage from one world to another. <clears throat> and then it says about these people, and this is the verse the lady quoted to me, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. Now you need to know that Baca is the Hebrew word for weeping. You can't understand that psalm unless you know that. So as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. And what this lady said to me was this, you may have to pass through the valley of weeping, but you don't have to stay there. And that in <laughs> that impacted me so deeply that I couldn't read any further for one hour. I just sat and gazed at that verse. And God did something. It says, as they pass through the valley of ba Baca, they make it a spring or a fountain. And at that moment, God opened a fountain inside me. Something I, I mean, I'd been a Christian nearly 60 years. Speaking in tongues and doing all those things. But there's something completely new happened in me. A spring, a fountain was opened inside me. And it was a fountain of compassion. And it was unlike anything I've ever experienced before. I've known the love of God. I've loved many people. I've certainly loved my wives and my family. But this was something not from Derek Prince. It has another source.
It was a spring, it was a fountain, and it was compassion. And I had never experienced anything exactly like it before. And I began, just began to understand what it means when it says Jesus was moved with compassion. And I realized God was sharing his compassion with me. Love is not a choice. It's a commandment. Jesus said, I'm not giving you a recommendation. I'm not making a suggestion. I'm giving you a commandment. Love one another. How are we to love one another? The same way that Jesus loved us. That is an unselfish, self-giving, seeking first the good of others. Jesus said, if you will have that kind of love, the whole world will sit up and take notice because they're not, they don't see it. They don't see it anywhere. What they see is selfishness, self-seeking, grabbing. You can revolutionize a whole situation by demonstrating the love of God. But bear in mind, it's not an option. It's not a recommendation. It's not a suggestion. It is a commandment. That's right. And so if we don't do it, what are we? In one simple word, we're disobedient. That's right. So we have two options. We can either love one another the way Jesus loved us and be obedient, or we can fail to love one another and be disobedient. But remember, this is not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. Jesus said very clearly and precisely, it is a commandment. But God has given me a supernatural concern for orphans, widows, the poor, and the oppressed. I mean, I, by the grace and mercy of God, I'm the head of a family of 12 adopted children. So it's not that I've never done anything for them. But I have seen with a new intensity, I don't want to preach Sunday night's message tonight, this morning. But I've seen that's what God is looking for. We can talk as much as we like about faith and righteousness, but if we do nothing for the people who really need us, we're just using empty words. And there's no shortage of people who need us. That's one thing we cannot complain about. They're not far from any of you. There are people who desperately need to be loved. They're lonely. They're not cared for. They have no answers. They're desperate. And you don't have to walk far from where you live to find people like that. I'll talk to you. If God wills and we live, I'll talk to you on Sunday night about that. But I've come to see that this is the what would I say? It's the purpose of God. It's what God is waiting for. I was preaching, even before I had this experience, I was preaching in the state of Virginia to a group of black brothers. And uh, at the end of the message, a young black man came up to me and he said, Brother Prince, would you pray for me? I said, what do you want? He said that I may speak to people with the same compassion that you have. <clears throat> I looked at him for a moment. I said, there's a price to pay. Because I knew I was paying the price. He was silent for a few minutes. Then he said, I want it anyhow. And I prayed for him. I don't doubt that God's hand is on that young man's life. I want it anyhow, no matter what it costs. Do you feel that way this morning? There's this fountain that God sovereignly will open up in you. It's not under your control. You don't decide when it will happen. You see, there are some things that don't come without suffering. I'm always, I've always been amazed at Paul's prayer in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him, Jesus. That's wonderful. We all say them. And the power of his resurrection. Well, we all say that. But the next verse, and the fellowship of his sufferings. And many, many times I said to the Lord, as I read that verse, Lord, I don't know that I can really say that. 
Do I really want to know the fellowship of your suffering? I'm an honest person. I think that's perhaps one of the basic benefits of God's dealing with me. I am honest to myself. I'm honest to others. I said, Lord, many times I'm really not sure I can say that I want to know the fellowship of your sufferings. And the Lord is very patient with me. He didn't pressure me. But you see, I've come to see that some things only come by suffering. Suffering does something that nothing else will do. It prepares the soil for that fountain. Then you see, I realize that things come that way that cannot come any other way. I've said for many years, God is a self-revealing God. He loves to reveal himself. He loves to share himself. <clears throat> but I've realized lately through what I've been through that God has a deeper desire than that. He wants us to share what he goes through, to share his experiences with him. And when you go through the valley, you're sharing something very precious, very wonderful. You'll come closer to the Lord than you've ever been. And that's what God wants. He's not interested in us suffering, but he's interested in his sharing his sufferings with us. I'm not talking about the sufferings of Jesus on the cross. Those were unique. Only he could do that. But I'm talking about the sufferings of Jesus for the church. <clears throat> Don't you think that Jesus is grieved sometimes by the way the church acts and behaves? We can be critical. We can accuse. We can point. And believe me, nobody could do that more effectively than I can. But that's not what God is waiting for. He's waiting. Will you share my deep concern for my bride? For the one I love so much? Can I share some of my sufferings with you? That's really when you're getting into deep water at that point. I have never been a superficial person. I'm tired of superficiality. I'm tired of empty religion. I'm tired of empty confessions, which are made to get something out of God, but we're never expected to fulfill them. <coughs> I really believe God has sent me here at this time to confront you people with a decision. How shall I express the decision? Lord, no matter what it takes, open that fountain in me. I don't want to be superficial. I don't want to be just a churchgoer. Lord, I want to bring joy to your heart. I want you to be satisfied with me. Not with what I do, but with me. I want to share fellowship with you in the deep places. When the Spirit of God moves, it's the humble that get blessed. It's the people that have no claims, no pride, no self-righteousness. Lord, here I am. I'm just a pool. Fill me.